When we made the bull, I was 22 years old. When I was in the military and I was serving over in the Persian Gulf, I was in the middle of the desert by Saudi Arabia and talking to local people over there and they wanted to know you better and describing what I did as a job, as a civilian back home. I explained to them the bull and people in the middle of the desert, they knew the bull, you know, so it was like famous worldwide. Everybody knew that bull. My name is Bill Mackey and I'm the owner of a Biddy Mackey Art Foundry and we primarily what we do is we make bronze castings uh, for the art world. We're, we're truly an extension of the artist's hand when it comes to bronze castings. My father, his name is Ishwan Maki. It was a communist country where he grew up and in, in communist countries you're pretty much uh, you're forced into trades and it turned out he was put into a you know like a foundry facility. So that's what he's been doing since he was uh, like 15 years old. Oh, there's thousands, if not tens of thousands of uh, sculptures I was created here. The most iconic ones, the Iwo Jima Monument was cast over here. So I would say the most famous one, what everybody knows, would be the Charging Bull down on Wall Street. We cast that back in 1989. The artist of the bull, the Charging Bull, is Arturo de Monica. He's immigrated from Italy. He went to art school over there for as far back as my memory. The early dealings my father had with him was like in the mid-70s. I always respected Arturo de Monica. He was very a very hands-on artist. So he appreciated what, what we were doing and he wouldn't give us a hard time if things were difficult and all that. He was totally understanding. He was a, a you know, a wild character. Whenever he had his uh, a commission, right away he took the money and he would buy himself a Ferrari or something like that. So he was wild like that. The first bull, it, it, it took us over a year altogether. Me and my brother would go down to his studio, pick up uh, sections of the bull and bring it to the foundry and we were casting it pretty much at the same time as he was creating it. Did you know that it was going to be installed illegally? Not really, no, not at the time. I kind of figured it out as we were doing it. Usually when we do a, a casting, when it's ready to be picked up, a truck will come first thing in the morning. We, we pick up the, the casting, we load it up onto the truck, and then he's on his way. For the bull, they, they actually came at the end of the day. And then I realized that he was what he was doing. French sand casting is, uh, it was originally done back in the 1600s. What I'm basing this foundry on now is tradition. They, they develop with different uh, processes. And they actually made the casting process easier to do. They made it more commercialized. And so French sand is very difficult to do. I believe it's a superior way to do larger castings. It's the, a lot of people don't do it, the other foundries don't do it, just because of the fact they don't know how to do it. When my father came into this country, he only had this one tool. That's all he had in his possession. That's what he learned in trade school back in Hungary. Yeah, so the sand that we're using over here, I would approximate that it's uh, easily over 100 years old. The sand that we're using today is the same sand that was used to cast the Iwo Jima Monument, was the same sand that was used to cast the, the bull on Wall Street. In the United States, we're the only foundry that, that's actually still doing the French sand casting process. So for me, it's important to keep the tradition, to keep on doing it, hopefully pass it down. My time uh, serving in the Gulf War, that was a very eye-opening experience. I saw how things are. I saw the, the horrors in life. You know, I learned how to appreciate the good things in life. And that's really helped me when I came back to this business, really appreciate this type of work. You know, we're working with your hands, you're constantly busy, and you're creating art, you know, it's a beautiful thing. So they came with the truck in the evening. We loaded it up. When we loaded up the, the bull, we also loaded a, a forklift. We went over the Manhattan Bridge. 
and then we headed downtown towards the New York Stock Exchange where he wanted to take the bull and he wanted to put it right underneath the tree like it was a Christmas present. He, he had it all timed to perfection when the uh, police would make their rounds around there and quickly uh, we got the forklift off the truck, we picked, it, picked up the bull and we dropped it off underneath the tree. And there was a lot of excitement. People were hanging out in bars like blocks before we were even at site and they were like following us. They saw this big bull on the back of a truck. You know, it was a typical New York moment. But it wasn't until the next day when it was in the newspapers and everything. I remember they had a, an article in the New York Times. They had the, the NYPD with a ticket book, you know, scratching his head. He didn't know what type of ticket to write for the, for the bull. <laughs> But uh, they did, they confiscated it uh, immediately the next day. They took it, but it was out in the papers and everything. It, was, it, it had its you know, fame already from just from one night. Off and on, I've been working with my father since I was like eight years old. I used to come in on weekends a after the war. I was 23 or so. That's when I started working with him full time. That's I had a relationship with him that I was with this man you know, nine hours a day, every day, you know, together, you know, and then just stop. One day he was killed unexpectedly. He was killed in the car accident. And the business is going and that's the first time, it's like, you know, my whole life, I always had my father over there making everything I'm doing, you know, you know, making decisions together. And he, he's not gonna be here anymore. And I, I was a little scared, but the fact that I was with him since I was eight years old, that really everything just, there was no problems. Even as I had a, his voice in my head, any situation that happened or anything, it's just uh, things continued. So it truly is a, a legacy, a tradition that he passed the, down to me. And it was only until then that I started working with my son. Then I had the feeling that it, then it hit me. It's like, oh, it's the same thing how I was with my father. Now my son is the same way, and it's, uh, yeah, I'm proud of it. I'm, I'm proud teaching him, I'm proud having him with me. It would be nice, but I, I, I would never push my kids to take over the foundry. It's a hard life, very physical. It's very demanding. The money isn't that great, and uh, it's getting harder and harder every day. So would I force it on my kids? No. The only way I would want them to do it, if they see the benefits of it, not be super materialistic about the world and enjoy life. You know, that's a, I really am enjoying what I'm doing over here. So they have to figure that out for themselves. Eventually, as time, I don't know how many months went by, people got word that he had the bull. It was famous, it made all the headlines. They wanted the bull back in Manhattan. And so where it is now, by Bowling Green Park, the, the building across the street, they, they pretty much own that property where the bull is sitting now. And with permission from, I believe, Parks Commissioner was Stern back then, they allowed the bull to be set up on that triangle. The horns and other places of the bull, which I won't mention, the, the original color is completely rubbed off from you know millions of people rubbing it, touching it, and it, it gives you a beautiful polished look to it. And to me, that's what the artwork is made for. It's made for interaction like that. Did you think you were gonna make history that night? No, no. So I've been doing this my whole life, making statues all the time. There's more statues that I made that I forgot about it, you know? And there's even statues that they're, saying, they're giving a lot of hype about it. This is gonna be the, the biggest, you know, most important thing, you know, you're working on, it's history, and you never hear about it again. So yeah, this was totally unexpected. I don't consider myself an artist. I just consider myself uh, an artisan helping the artists fulfill what they want in their bronze needs. One of the things that, that what I loved about my job and I really didn't appreciate 
until after the fact that my father had passed away, is that I spent many days just working side by side with my dad and, and he would uh, be telling stories all the time. One of the things he would mention that one of his uh, customers would come in here and they would walk in and they would say this place is like a cathedral for them. They would walk in there, the way the light was shining through the skylights and everything, they were just in awe. You know, some type of a uh, spiritual feeling for them when they came in here. And he would always say that. And then going through the years and, and younger artists, uh, pretty much artists that weren't even born when he was telling me these stories, they're coming in and they're saying the same thing. Well, artists, it's important. Art is, for me, it's a fabric of life. How we go ahead and make the original sculptures, the engineering involved, you know, it's all, it's really a metaphor of life. When my father passed away, his life is carried on. Every time I see a, an artwork that he worked on, I know the story is involved with it. The medium of bronze will stand the test of time.